spread the fire fam welcome back to smwx and on today's episode i have a fantastic interview with two of south africa's most luminous minds on political and legal matters respectively i have ukoko aubrey machikri who's well known to this channel uh one of the most popular guests we've had on this channel and also advocate muzis kakane one of the country's leading senior advocates and also a person of great political activist pedigree too. I hope you enjoy this conversation between the three of us. Like, share, subscribe, and make sure that you stay locked on SMWX for 2022. Let's get into it. Aye, aye. Why are we afraid to name the problem? And as you are saying, Sobi, why are we afraid to tackle the economic question? Why are we ducking it? Now, if you, if you go back to the Freedom Charter and the Constitution, I suspect when I look at certain formulations in both that the, the answer to this question is that things that may offend white people should not be said. In, in other words, the authors of the Freedom Charter and the authors of the Constitution consciously, unconsciously or otherwise, seem to have decided that there will be no formulation in the Freedom Charter, there will be no formulation in our constitution that will offend those who benefited from the crime of colonialism and the crime of apartheid. But what that betrays is the extent to which nothing has changed. In other words, those who held power, economic and otherwise, during colonialism, and those who held power during apartheid are still the ones who hold power today. And therefore today, you can't have ideas propounded. You can't have formulations of ideas that will offend those who hold power. Who hold power partly because their worldview, their ways of seeing, their ways of doing, and their ways of being remain dominant. And so what we have here is a situation where in this debate, if you ignore problems with the article by the minister, the nub of the argument challenges the status quo. And we are not going to have that. We are not going to have that precisely because when a worldview becomes dominant, it must be imposed, it must be reinforced, and it must be reproduced so that it becomes so commonsensical that those who hold a different view fall outside a canon of rational opinion. And therefore what they think is deemed irrational. Now the danger of course here is that we must always bear in mind, as I have said in the past, that every cause, no matter how noble, has its tyrants. Now, defense of democracy and that which is democratic comes disguised as all sorts of things, including tyranny. Let me repeat that point. The commitment to democracy and that which is democratic comes disguised as all sorts of opportunistic things, including I think to some extent, 
it is this tyranny the debate about the U.S. Sulu's article. I um, I was struck by the the reference to the Freedom Charter, Gogo, which already, as you say, maybe deviates from some of the principles espoused by the broader liberation struggle. Um, but you might even argue that the constitution deviates even further from that deviation. So when we look at, again, the preamble, which I understand has no real legal force, but is it's supposed to narrate the history of the country and, and, and explain why we have this new constitution. We find this line, uh, we the people of South Africa, the various other lines, and then uh, believe that South Africa belongs to all who live in it, comma, united in our diversity. I mean, it, it just, <laughs> what does that even mean? I mean, why do we need to add this, this extra clause yeah. just, to, just to make sure that we're not really going the Freedom Charter route, don't worry, it's, it's, it's Freedom Charter light. Yeah. Um, and again, when, when I hear uh, the, the, the mindless defense of the constitution, sure, there's, there's, there's a nuanced defense of the constitution, which I think we all welcome. But there's, there's an equally mindless defense of the constitution, which is the same as the mindless attack on the constitution, which, which isn't uh, looking at the text and it's just uh, making wild claims about it. But, but really, I don't see those who defend the constitution explaining to us why we needed to add that extra, extra clause to this, free, this clause which comes from the Freedom Charter to, to, to uh, somehow diminish the Freedom Charter clause just so it's palatable. To who? Well, you be the judge. So it just seems to me that the constitution represents something of a deviation from the liberation struggle and the, and the difference between those two explains to some extent why we are in the crisis we are in. And I'm not saying, and I, and I, have, to, I have to stress this, I'm not saying that the constitution is the only thing to blame. And this is where I do take issue with Minister Sassoon's article because um, she speaks of politicians in the article and those politicians are ANC politicians uh, who have, in my view, um, contributed vastly to the crisis that we're in now, uh, and in some ways participated in the apartheid-like injustices of the present. So, but I, I believe we can say both. I think we can say, yes, ANC politicians have failed dramatically, and we have a structural crisis which is linked to the economy, and the way that the legal order um, inscribes and reinscribes our economic injustices. And uh, I just wanted to end on that point by saying that <clears throat> maybe the question is not so much just about the constitution, um, although I think the constitution is imperfect and flawed in certain respects, especially in the values sections and the early sections. But maybe the question is about the legal order as a whole, which of which the constitution supposedly and theoretically sits at the apex. But we've got all these sources of law and, and all these case laws that have to be brought from old eras into the new. And, and then we have legal cultures and uh, the design of courtrooms that also come from, you know, the, from past eras and, and legal attire and language, as Babs Kakane has already mentioned, the predominance of English. Even if our constitution is all that it's cracked up to be, it still seems to me that the whole legal order itself is still far, far from even, uh, even moving away from the inheritances that we have, that we have been given from, from colonialism and apartheid. And it's almost as if the constitution diverts us from looking at the whole legal order itself, uh, which, which seems to still re-entrench in some ways uh, apartheid patterns. Um, but uh, Babs Kakane obviously knows much more about this than I do and has seen it up close, but 
it seems to me we're not having the conversation about the legal order and we're confining the conversation just to the constitution. Yeah, I, I think you're right, Sizwe. I mean, it's not just Marxist, but I think it's, 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 it's a fact of life that law will tend to be dominated by a dominant class in that society. Look at people who are defending the constitution. Tell me who they are and what exactly, what class are they? Is the constitution being defended by the multitudes of our, of our people in New Brighton, in Wamashu, in following in Kiani? No, it's being defended by people who in some way are defending the stability that we have of the status quo. Whether they are black or white, but it's people who are defending or legitimizing inequality, inadvertently or consciously, but that's the effect. And the legal order that we need to have in a country that emerges from colonialism is a legal order, order that is the antithesis of, of what you're coming out from. And that is what we must understand. And I think the problem with lawyers um, and journalists and judges and politicians have always said, have very little capacity for self-reflection. In fact, most of them and are- politi and political analysts. Involved. And political <laughs> analysts, particularly and who are some of show hosts. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Is that what we are seeing now I was, look at the NGOs that have come down on the minister. These are people who pretend they, they defend the constitution and they come out to actually attack someone for expressing a view. Why? Because it's a lie. What they do is to defend the status quo. These are defenders. These are poster boys of whiteness parading as constitutionalists, but they defend the constitution because they know that this constitution defends the privileges, the ill-gotten wealth that is transported from the apartheid order into the new one and must be kept like that for you and me, for black people to remain happy in poverty and landlessness. And we create a legal order that hardly tackles that. And therefore, even the, I didn't see the, the challenge even on the judiciary as, a, as, a, as an insult. I thought it's important for us to look at ourselves and see whether we've not become party to ensuring the continued survival of the very white power, the very Western notions of our life uh, that we sought to fight. And so we must be careful. When I saw the deputy chief justice on TV, I feared him. I feared that the court can come down on society, on someone about expressing their view. We must be more tolerant than that. And our courts and our leaders must be more tolerant even of robust criticism because it is on that basis that we will beat the vestiges of colonialism, the vestiges of apartheid and the inequality uh, that is in our societies, both politicians and, um, and judges and journalists who must be more tolerant. My criticism of the ANC and maybe of Minister Sisulu is that I've often watched that the ANC itself entrenches this neoliberal outlook. And so I'm very skeptical when an ANC leader um, talks left because usually as soon as they are elected, they become part of this neoliberal outlook. Um, that, that is the same as that of the DA, the same of that of the Nationalist Party and every capitalist champion in society. And so I'm skeptical. I think we need more changes from society and we must imagine our lives and our freedom without the ANC and challenge the system that sometimes the ANC defends soon after uh, elections. Well, could be, when I read the article by the minister, one of the things I saw, rightly or wrongly, is an attempt on her part to position herself outside the problem. And, and, and what is the problem? The problem is that the ANC, our leaders, 
have become allies of coloniality. That's the problem. And there's an attempt in this article to position herself outside the problem. And this opens her up to the accusation that she is just being opportunistic to achieve the end of becoming the president of the ANC and maybe the, the president of the country. So this is one of the things I saw um, in reading this article. Now, to go back to the question of the rule of law, she is right to ask the question, whose rule of law? Because the rule of law is not an objective reality. The rule of law comes into existence as a result of subjective conceptions of the rule of law coming into conflict and into battle. And a particular conception of the rule of law then triumphs. This is what has happened here. A particular conception of the rule of law has triumphed in South Africa. It exists in part to defend the following. The land must remain in white hands. The economy must remain in white hands. And white people must be in charge of our legal system. That's what it exists in part to defend. And I then ask the question, when a worldview, ways of seeing, ways of doing and ways of being have become dominant and the counter hegemonic cannot see the light of day even to the extent that the counter hegemonic represents better alternatives. Is it then, I kept on asking myself when I looked at the ferocity with which Lindy Wessisul was attacked, is it then possible for white people to give up the land peacefully? Is it possible for white people to give up the economy peacefully? Is it possible for them to give up their control of the legal system peacefully? In other words, I am convinced that one of the things that must happen for change to happen in South Africa is that white magnanimity must kick in. I am not holding my breath because all I see is the rampant arrogance of whiteness, which means white magnanimity is not going to kick in. If white magnanimity is not going to kick in, what must kick in for South Africa to go through fundamental change and transformation? And is that kicking in possible by peaceful means? That's the question I ask, and by saying so, because in, in this country, um, we, 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 we have a state that will take you to jail or will attempt at least uh, if you say certain things and we'll, we'll pretend we are saying another uh, so that they can um, harass you. I'm not calling for violence. Um, but violence can happen without the spilling of blood. I am talking about whether fundamental change in South Africa is possible without a certain element of social, political, and economic instability. That's, that's the question I ask. Sizwe, let me answer this question. By all means, by all means. I, I'm going to be more blunt than Aubrey asks or poses the question. First, we are where we are because we have a, a settlement that did not match the violent nature of colonialism and apartheid. And the wide arrogance Aubrey is talking about happens because those who maimed us, those who killed us, 
those who place the entire population on the margins of, of, of the human condition, those who kept generations where they are, have never faced the violence through which they put us. And this compromised settlement and white arrogance are a product of a settlement that was designed to appease them. Violence begets violence. And so poverty is violent to the poor. Colonialism was violent. Apartheid was violent. Gender discrimination we know is violent. And what then do you do to do away with a system that is violent, that continues to impose itself on people who already for centuries have gone through violence? Is that I'm calling for this. I think society in general must rise up against this state, against this system that their generations, their forefathers went through. When I say they must rise up, I mean fundamentally to correct the shortcomings of our political settlement. I'm not saying they must be violent because it seems like we can no longer go there. Because we can no longer go there, uh, because I do support something called the just war, but it just can't happen. But I think we cannot live our lives as if things are normal when black people have to tolerate the mere fact that they have political rights that you talked about, but we live in poverty for the rest of their lives. And once in a while, this system co-ops, Cisre co-ops, Muzi co-ops, Aubrey to defend it. But what are we defending? We're defending a system that will put down our people, black people, for a very, very long time. And I think it's time people imagined their lives outside the political party, defied white power, rise up against the system, go to the streets if they must, peacefully, but they must completely overthrow the system that has continued to put us where we are. If we don't do that, Caesar, our generations to come will blame us. And I think it's important that we do this, not because we hate anybody, because we love our people and we love our generations, we love our children. We cannot bequeath to them our coward ways and our failures to correct colonialism because we get co-opted by the system uh, that we have. Let me just add this quickly, Shubi, uh, uh, before you come in. Uh, Jill Scott Heron says um, the revolution will not be televised. I say the revolution will not happen in English because the imposition of this worldview in South Africa happens in the main through English. And therefore, to speak in English is to be rational. Not to speak English is to be irrational. So here we are hyperventilating in English about this article by Minister Sisulu, forgetting that the preponderance of the people who are talking about, who still bear the brunt of neo-apartheid, do not suffer neo-apartheid in English. So we are those of us who engage with social, political, and economic reality in this country in English. We are doing something that is akin to playing with ourselves if you get what I mean. Because the majority of those we are talking about, we cannot hear, not because they don't have a voice, they do have a voice. We don't hear the voice. We don't hear the voice because it is not in English. So, yeah, and it circles back to the constitution as well, which I'm sure there, there are translations and, and you know, uh, there are tokenistic gestures towards making our courtrooms and our justice system more representative, but 
quite frankly, the only game in town is English. The only culture in town is, is, a, is, a, is a legal culture and a legal set of attires, etc., inherited from, um, from outside. It, it still baffles me that <laughs> we can even watch a, 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 a case in the Supreme Court of the United Kingdom where people wear suits. Yet, yeah, we, we, we still have to have a system where our attire is actually more archaic than the English <laughs> uh, Supreme Court uh, attire, um, for example. Um, and uh, Goko, um, Baba, uh, I think without, because I can suddenly see um, another hour of conversation on the horizon, but um, I'm conscious of your time. Uh, I know that uh, the audience will be begging us to do this again, uh, but uh, one day. Um, but what I wanted to end on, um, and I'll come to both of you on this, is I think there is a certain uh, responsibility that those of us who, who are uh, critiquing and criticizing the status quo have, which is, which is uh, trying at least to, to start looking at painting what an alternative can look like. And of course, no one person can do this. It, it's a collective effort. It will probably take multiple generations. But for me, I think one of the problems that we have when we critique the status quo is that people then say, well, the alternative is more dangerous than the stability of the present. So I'd prefer stability to the unknown. And for me, I think it's, it's about changing the perspective and saying that actually we critique because there's an opportunity. There's an opportunity to have a more just society. There's an opportunity to unlock economic redistribution. There's an opportunity to deal a blow to injustice. And we can't get to that kind of society if we believe that everything we have at the moment is perfect and it's just uh, the ANC government's failures that, 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 are, that stand between us and you know, this, this more just society. Um, so for me, it's, it's how do we create alternatives and an even more just order, an even more just constitution, an even more uh, racially just, gender just society. That's, that's the ultimate aim and the ultimate goal that we are driving towards. It's not just chaos and uh, destruction. It's, it's actually something better than what we have right now, which quite frankly as a status quo is is far from uh, speaking for itself. Um, and that for me is the project. I just find it so unoriginal for intellectuals and establishment voices to, to, to defend the status quo, which is so indefensible. Surely our task as, as those speaking into society is to think of something better than the version of South Africa or whatever this country will one day be called that, than we currently have. Well, this is a part of what the last point you make. I, I'm, I'm usually in despair when I watch our intellectuals on TV because I'm beginning to think the problem is in our education system. We're just <laughs> not taught critical thinking that people are happy to be fed a particular hegemonic discourse and there's no original thought. And that is why they are unable to think outside uh, what's available. Second, this is when you talk about choosing the stability we have rather than the unknown. You know, since so that statement is something you, me, and Aubrey and others can afford because the stability of what is what we have is not a, a night without food and blankets. It's not a night without a roof. So this stability, this state of affairs we call stability, <laughs> we say so because we are middle class. Poverty is no stability. Landlessness is no stability. And so for millions of people that we, as Aubrey says, we don't see and we don't hear, the situation is in havoc right now, every day for them. And so we are sitting on a time bomb as we talk amongst ourselves, as Aubrey calls it, playing with ourselves. And because we are a minority, we just have a voice. And one day, if we don't confront these things, 
We don't confront our own neoliberal outlook in policy making. We don't confront our own fear of whiteness. We don't confront our own ability to get co-opted into a system that makes us undermine our own people. Nothing will change. So we need to call upon everybody to engage with the good constitution that we have to see in what ways we can make sure that it advances society and improves the plight of the poor. Because if we don't, Cesar, we, were, we are sitting on a civil war waiting to happen. Thank you. Well, I, I think Mbama is, is correct because I keep on asking the question, what is the end game when we have this discussion? And, and I will repeat the point that I made right at the beginning, that the struggle against apartheid colonialism was a struggle for the creation of a society that would be the antithesis of apartheid society. But that society, which is the antithesis of apartheid society, is not an end in itself. What must follow is another struggle. A struggle to create a society that itself is the antithesis of that society, which is the antithesis of apartheid society. And as I said, this is an unending task. It's a task we cannot engage in. If we do not do what was said by an Egyptian author who said, politics is the art of the possible. Revolution is the art of the impossible. Furthermore, this fear of the known, we can articulate that argument in terms of the ideas of J. Krishnamurti, probably my favorite philosopher, who talks about the imperative of freeing ourselves from the known. One of the reasons we are here in South Africa today is the known. And our refusal or inability to free ourselves from the known. Now, of course, to free yourself from the known does not mean you must discard the known because you must know that from which you must free yourself. And what we must free ourselves from are the ravages of colonialism, apartheid, and the neo-apartheid of today. Now, of course, the moment you free yourself from the known, another struggle begins to free yourself from that which you have come to know now. That too is an unending task. Now, that unending task means that we have the world as it is, and the world as we want it to be. Now, South Africa of 2022, as the world that it is today, and our dream of, the, of what the world must become, means that we must ask ourselves two questions. Must change or care within the paradigm or outside? the current paradigm. And if you look at the time and series of actions that must take place for fundamental change to occur, it seems to me conversations must be about change within the current paradigm, which opens the way for change outside the current paradigm. My final word is to our judiciary, particularly the Constitutional Court, assuming rightly or wrongly that Acting Chief Justice Raymond Zondo was speaking on behalf um, of the um, Constitutional Court 
in his hysterical response to the minister. My advice to them, if you are speaking on their behalf, is that there is a worrying tendency on their part. They seem to have very thin skins. They, they seem to be hypersensitive to criticism. And, and as Moose was saying, our constitutional order can be based on the egos of judges. It must be based on something much more substantive, substantive and much more substantial. And my advice therefore to them is please grow a thicker skin. Well, go, go, uh, go, go, uh, Baba. Thank you so much for joining us on SMWX. Uh, this was one of the most incredible conversations. Um, and it's, uh, it's just so refreshing because you just can't find conversations of this kind um, in, in, in our media, uh, on our media landscape or, or very rarely. Um, so it was a great honor and a privilege to have both of you such towering minds in your various fields, um, gracing our audience. And thank you so much for taking the time. Um, I am sure we will have so many views and I will be sure to keep you updated with how far this conversation uh, extends. Um, but thank you so much. All right, all right, okay. Thanks.